and said that there was a famous sculptor once that was noted for his really intricate detail work in carving horses out of stone. So somebody asked him how he did it, and he said, it's real simple. I just remove anything that's not the horse. And that's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to remove anything from our life that's not like Jesus. And so that's good, but Satan is just the opposite. And he wants to put things in our life that shouldn't be there. He wants to bring out the old that stains and defiles. He wants us to live for self, gratifying the desires of the flesh with every carnal gratification that is available to us. He lies. He deceives. He causes us to rationalize our sins away and doubt the truth of God's word. He creates conflict, dissension, and disunity in church after church after church. And many churches are in trouble today. He's behind anything that keeps God from being glorified. And what his goal is, is to take God's glory away from God. And he, that's, that's not the right position. He's the one who entices us to sin with temptations from our flesh. And he tries to hinder what we're doing that's good. And so it seems like every way we turn, Satan is in the way. And that's because he's in the way every way we turn. Christians gain victory over temptations of Satan when we know his plans. And the Bible tells us what his plans are. The Bible tells us what his nature is and how he thinks and how he acts. And so we look to the Bible for that. Several truths we can learn about Satan we'll look at tonight. One is he's the tempter. He tempts us. He entices us to do things we ought not to do. Satan is behind every temptation. Think about it. If you think of every time you're tempted, whether it's a little thing, buy that extra chocolate bar when nobody's looking, or a big thing, you know, go rob a bank. Satan is behind all of that, every bit of it. And we can blame him. You know, the old expression from the 60s, the devil made me do it. And so it's kind of like, well, the devil made me do it, so it's okay. No, that's not okay. We are responsible for every thought we have, every thought we think or dwell on. We're responsible for every action we have and every, every behavior. God's not glorified when we succumb to temptations, when we sin. And so we need to think about that. Every temptation is from Satan, and God does not get glory when we sin. And, and those we need to remember together. Satan attracts us to do things of the world and tempts us to have an attitude of entitlement. And that's running rampant in our society today. I'm entitled. It's the same attitude that Eve had in the garden when he, Satan tempted her with the fruit, and she felt he made her think she was entitled to it. Why can't I have the fruit of the garden? I can have everything else. Why is God withholding this from me? I should have it. I need it. I want it. It's, it should be mine. And she took it. She sinned. And we're the same way. We start thinking, well, everybody else is doing this. We can look around the church and say, other Christians are doing this. Leaders in the church are doing this. Deacons are doing this. Preachers are doing this. And so we're still responsible to God for every sin that we commit. When we start thinking we're entitled, then we become selfish. We have that self-centered attitude. And then, if that's not good enough, Satan tries to question our faith. Is that really what God said? Is that really what God meant? Does that include you? Or does it exclude you? And he'll start tempting us with a lack of faith. Once our faith goes away, it'll be easy to justify anything else. Because if we're not standing on the word of God, then anything goes. The only absolute in our world is God and his word. And so we have to stand on the word of God and quote it to ourselves. That's why we need to memorize scriptures there, just as we need it. In 1 John we read from verse 15 to 17, don't love the world, don't love anything in the world. And he talked about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Well, the lust of the flesh is appeals to the gratification of our old sinful nature. It's the idea of, well, if this feels right, it must be right. I kind of like this, so it must be okay. That's the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the eyes appeals to the aesthetic nature that we have. We see something, and it looks good. And we begin to desire it. And then we become covetous uh, toward it. And we commit that sin of, I desire that. I have to have that. I want that. 
rather than desiring God. And the pride of life appeals to our being the center of attention. And so we become self-centered and we want the attention, we want the glory, we want the praise, we want the pats on the back, we want the recognition, all of that. And you've seen all of this from time to time in church, if you've been in church very long at all. It happens. Satan tempts. And sometimes we sin. And so if we compare that to the passage in Genesis, it's just what happened to Eve. The um, lust of the flesh, it appealed to the sinful nature, it looked like something good, lust of the eyes, she coveted the fruit and the pride of life, self-centered, and she put herself first and she helped herself to what she wanted. And that's the exact same scenario we find ourselves in time and time again when we deal with the simplest te uh, sin and temptation to a more complex sin and temptation. It's the same thing over and over again. Jesus also warned his disciples. In Luke 22, he said, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Mark wrote it a little bit stronger than that. Mark is essentially Peter's gospel. And it was, Jesus said, stay awake or alert and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And how often have we found ourselves in that situation where we really want to do good, but the flesh is weak. Resisting temptation is, is not passive. Sometimes it seems like we just have to just not do any what Satan's tempting us to. He tempts us, and as long as we don't do it, that's good. But it's not passive like that. It's active. If we're actively doing God's will, then we won't be succumbing to the temptations of Satan. We have to stay in tune with what God has for us. We have to be engaged in what God is doing so that we don't get distracted into the temptations that Satan puts before us. Also, when we feel tempted, we need to spend a lot of time reading the Bible. Sometimes it's just we hadn't had enough intake of the Word of God, and Satan kind of overtakes us. We need to spend a lot of time reading the Word of God and applying it to our lives. We need to fellowship with Christians. That's why it's hard to come sometimes on Wednesday night and when we used to have Sunday night and different times like that, revival every night. But that's that fellowship with God. And it's, Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron. We're with each other. We encourage each other. We help each other resist temptation when we're around each other. So we need Bible reading. We need fellowship. And we need to be serving. Find a place of service. Too many have elected not to have a part in different areas of the church life. And they find that they're, they're weaker Christians because of that. When you're involved in church life and your own committees and you're serving different areas, you're going to be busy and you're going to be thinking about church, thinking about the Lord, thinking about reaching out to others. And it's more about doing for others. And when we're doing for others, we're not going to be as easily tempted when it's about ourselves. In Second Peter, Peter wrote, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment till the day of judgment. When we realize we're being tempted, we should go to the Lord and begin to analyze where we are spiritually. And it may be we need to read the Word a little bit, pray a little bit, maybe be with other Christians a little bit. But we need to turn to God. Secondly, Satan, Satan will hinder us from doing the will of God. Not only does he tempt us, he hinders us. And it's doesn't, not so much he grabs you and throws you to the ground kind of thing, but he just put little hindrances in the way, stuff to slow you down. He'll hinder whatever brings glory to God. And so we might be real busy doing other things that don't bring glory to God. And everybody looks at us and says, oh, wow, you're doing so much. Good stuff. But we're not bringing glory to God. So that hindrance pushed us away from bringing glory to God. We have to be careful about that. It may not be a great sin, but just not doing what you're called to do. I can only bring, or the main reason, or the main way I bring glory to God is when I do what uh, he called me to do, to be preaching, preaching the word, teaching the word. And so that's the main thing I can do is be prepared and teach and preach the word of God. That's the main way I bring glory to him because I'd much rather be doing something else in my secular thinking and my, the way I was, I don't like being up front. That's just not me. That's my calling. That's what God wants me to do. And so every time I stand up in front of a, a group of people to lead, whether small or large crowd, it shows I'm giving up my selfish nature of wanting to 
hide out somewhere and be alone to be to honor God and to take his word and proclaim it. And God gets the glory for that. Satan loses. God gets the glory. There are a lot of things that can divert our attention and distract us from God's will. I've known those that were called to the ministry as young men, but they didn't want to do that. Uh, I remember one in, when I was in college, and he was in the youth group. And when uh, he graduated high school, and it wasn't shortly about after that, he got married. And he couldn't afford to go to seminary, and he ended up working somewhere. Um, his daddy was the uh, same thing. He was called in the ministry, but he was had a family at that point, and he didn't go in the ministry. I know another man that uh, the same thing. Well, this one man, uh, when he retired, he did eventually become a pastor. But he'd wasted all those years. He made a lot of good money, but he wasn't serving the Lord where he was called to. He was doing all the good things, but not what he was called to do. And so I, I know those illustrations where. They were called, but they didn't do it. They didn't drop out of church. They didn't quit doing things. They just weren't doing what God called them to do. And so God didn't get as, as much glory for that. When we make sacrifice to do what God calls us to, he gets more glory. Because it shows Satan that we're putting God first above all else. We're willing to do that. And Jesus told the disciples one day, it's going to cost you everything. Money, family, uh, even your own life sometimes. And many in the crowd left. So that's too difficult. We can't do that. But when we do, it gives God glory. Being faithful to serve in church doesn't recall, doesn't replace a call. And the call may not be to preach or be a music director. The call can be a lot of things. It may be you're called to be a, a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you're called to be a youth leader or to serve as a deacon, that's a calling. I've seen most of the ones I've, deacons I've worked with have felt a calling to do that. Those that don't have that, somehow they just don't make as good a deacon. And maybe you're called to minister in other ways. Some, I think, are called to pray. And they just have an unusual prayer life. And it's, it's amazing. The Bible tells us some people are called in a special way to be generous givers. They make a lot of money, they give a lot of money. And it's a blessing. Some are called to be administrators and they're good leaders in the church. And so where we are called is important and nothing takes the place of our call. There are other hindrances that keep us from doing things like witnessing to our neighbor or other ministries like serving in the local ministry centers around town, whatever they may be, if, if we're called to that. It may be simply... I don't want to take any responsibility in church. And God's calling us in this. Nope, I'm not going to do it. And, and that could be a call too, that we're being sidetracked. And it's just a, a, a stumbling block. It's a hindrance that Satan puts there. In 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul wrote, We wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. A hindrance of Satan. Again, he wrote in Romans, I have been prevented many times from coming to you. God can use that, and he did. He sent Paul in a different direction, but he attributed it to Satan that he couldn't go to a church to see them when he wanted to. And sometimes God will close the door and directs us to a new ministry. And I've, I've had that experience in my life too. I was called to foreign missions. Ann and I both were. We prepared for it. had everything underway. We talked to the foreign mission board. We got our applications, and we were about halfway through. I was filling mine out in the office and at home. And about midway, it just seemed like the Lord didn't want us to finish that. And whatever it was, he wanted us to prepare for it, but not go. And we still have a heart for missions, big heart for missions. But that isn't the field he had for us. And so we ended up in the Mississippi Delta. God is in control. When Satan hinders, God can still turn it around for good. And then number three. How do we deal with temptations and hindrances that Satan puts on our path? And one key to avoid being hindered by Satan is disciplined time management. You didn't expect that, did you? Disciplined time management. On this spectrum of time management, there are two extremes. There are some people who are so casual in life 
They just kind of go with the flow. Whichever way the wind blows, that's where they go. If they see something going on over here, they'll go help you over here, and then something over here, and and, and uh, they, they're good, helpful people. But they're not focused. The other extreme are those that are so managed that they don't have any flexibility. And they just, they got their time, they got their schedule, they're going to do what's on the schedule. If it's not on the schedule, they're not gonna, they don't have time for it. And so God can't use them for spontaneous directing to minister to one on the path. And I've had many, probably most that I've witnessed to, were just kind of spontaneous right there. And I was on the back of a bus one time, when I was doing summer mission work, and my partner and I were on the bus at about 5 o'clock, rush hour, the bus was packed, people were standing, there were two seats in the back. So we went to the back, and there was some lady there, and I started talking to her about the Lord, and she revealed to me that she'd just come from the lawyer signing divorce papers. She was just really upset, really hurt him, and she was open to the gospel witness. Just very spontaneous, uh, directed by God. Two seats, where were they? Right next to her. That's a God thing. And that happens. We have to be willing to be flexible, but we need to manage our time. We need to have a plan. We need to know what we're doing. What has God called you to? How are you going to do that? And stay focused on it. The, there's a balance we have to have. Paul realized that he had to stay focused on God's calling and purpose in his life. And we a focused commitment is even more than time management. We need to have time management, but it, need, it needs to be, when, when I was in seminary, in pastoral ministry class, Dr. Cawthon told us that the sermons, sermons come around real quickly. I saw a cartoon once about the relentless return of the Sabbath, you know, the Lord's Day. And it's true, it's just every time you turn around, it's time for another one. And, and you have to stay prepared, you have to work ahead. But Dr. Cawthon said, Dr. Cawthon said, we have to always be thinking, preaching thinking about the next sermon, thinking about illustrations that we might see in our path. And he encouraged us to write three sermon illustrations a day on our um, on note so cards. I've, I've sort of gotten that way, not really by because he said so, but I found that that's the way that works. I'm just always thinking of my sermons, where I'm headed, what's coming on down the road, and things like that. Well, that's not your calling. That's not what you need to be thinking. But what about, do you constantly think about that person in line ahead of you, are they lost or saved? Do they need a word of encouragement? Are they having a bad day or a good day? And how could I encourage them? And, and we may be irritated by the person in front of us because they're going too slow and we're in a hurry. But what's going on in that person's life? Are we thinking about them? Are we thinking about how we can make a difference in their life because I have Christ in my life? That's something we can think about. We can think about doing um, encouragement and we can think about inviting people to church. We can think about different ones on our prayer list from our congregation about how are they doing? Do they need a visit or, or encouragement? Do they need something? They need us to run an errand or something. We can be thinking about other people all the time. That's one way to avoid temptations and hindrances that Satan will put on our path. It's staying focused on calling. Another distraction Satan uses is making us focus on ourselves. In Matthew, Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples for his death. It was a death on the cross. And Peter was thinking more about himself. He didn't want to lose Jesus. And he said, Jesus, this isn't ever going to happen. And you remember what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. Satan will put in our minds our interest. And so that's one of the problems in business meetings in churches. The church will want to go a direction and somebody will think, well, I don't want to do that. I, I'm, I'm doing other things in my life, and I don't want to do that. So I don't want the church to do that. Because if the church does that and I don't, then I'll look bad. And so if the church doesn't do it, they don't have to do it, and they don't look so bad. And that can be a hindrance. It can hinder the whole church when it has that attitude. When we're in the will of God, we may not experience safety and security. And I know a lot of times... My mother used to worry about me because I'd go places that weren't that, didn't look that safe, and they probably weren't. But I was witnessing the folk in those areas. I've been to some very dangerous areas. In New Orleans, I went with a guy one time and was ministering in one of the project areas. Very dangerous area, but people were responding to the Lord in that area. 
and even here, that's happened. Uh, we're not promised that we'll always be safe. Uh, I have a friend that said one time he was in Dallas and he was in a in a, uh, a situation where some guy was coming up to him and, and was going to punch him. And so it says like that guy hit a wall, just wham, and he wasn't injured at all. So another time it was a similar situation, and the guy hit him and broke his nose. So sometimes it may be safety, sometimes we may be hurt. We don't know. Are you still willing to serve the Lord? And are you still willing to give God the glory? Let God get the glory because we're willing to do that kind of thing. Sometimes the only path to God being glorified is through our suffering or even our death. And we have heard stories of missionaries who died on the field that encourage us to be faithful. And um, what was that, Jim Elliott? Jim Elliott. Now, we've been hearing tales of that since the 60s. So far, what is that, 40, 60 years now? He's been inspiring uh, us to be strong way beyond his lifetime. And if he had lived, we may never even heard of him. But in his death, we did. And the faithfulness of his wife to forgive those Indians and eventually she led them to the Lord. And so sometimes, and we don't want to think about that. Sometimes it's through our reversals. People look at us and say, wow, they've remained faithful. What a Christian they are. It may be through our ill health instead of healing that gives God the glory. And so we don't need to look at adversities in life and let Satan use those for temptations. That doesn't mean we need to go looking for them either. But if it happens, we keep trusting in God. Until it happens, we keep trusting in God with all our ability. We're sometimes can be enticed or distracted because we're used to our comfort and our security and safety. But those aren't promised. There was... Um, one story told of a missionary couple that was preparing to go overseas and they were in the training by the IMB to go overseas. And the family of that couple had a judge to give an injunction against them taking the children overseas. And they couldn't go because of family. There are some extremes like that. And... But the bottom line is, what are you willing to do for the Lord? Are you willing to be where He wants you to be? Are you willing to do what He's called you to do? Regardless of the cost, regardless of the situation you're in, are you willing to be the person God wants you to be and serve in the area that He wants you to serve? And only you know where that is. We need to be aware of Satan's tactics. We need to keep close to God through God's Word. Jesus told the cost of discipleship, and he tells us the same cost. It cost us everything. But the benefit is worth it. God rewards those who bring him glory. God gets the glory when we put him first.